Yay, I think I got it working. So, welcome to our simple gathering here. The Sermon on the Mount is what we've been looking at for the last number of weeks. And the Sermon on the Mount concludes with three contrasts. Um, the first is a contrast between the narrow gate, which leads to a narrow pathway, which leads us in to the tree of life. It leads us in into life. It leads us into God. It leads us into God's heart. Uh, but it's a difficult path. Um, in order to travel that path, it goes through the fire. It goes past the sword. It goes by way of the cross. It's the path of resurrection, but standing between us and the resurrection is, of course, uh, the cross. And Jesus said for us to take up our crosses daily and follow him. The second contrast is between false and true prophets or guides. Um, there are many uh, false guides who would try to tell us that the wide gate and the wide path, the path which uh, um, traditionally in literature is called Primrose Lane, um, is the way to go, and that, that in fact that's the way God wants us to go. And so there's uh, a danger in following the wrong people. And then this final contrast, of course, is between um, a house that's built on the rock and a house that's built on sand. So it has to do, obviously, with foundations. Jesus said, and uh, it's recorded for us in Matthew 7, 24, everyone then, or some translations say, everyone therefore, uh, <clears throat> or some of them start with therefore, therefore everyone, everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. The word that's translated great there could also be translated gigantic. It was a gigantic fall. So, Jesus uh, begins this uh, last contrast um, with that word then or therefore, um, which ties us back into everything that he said. Uh, everyone then, everyone therefore who hears these words of mine, what's he talking about? He's talking about all the things that we've read in chapters 5, 6, and 7. Everyone who hears those words and puts them into practice is a wise person, and those who hear them but don't put them into practice um, would be foolish people. So Jesus is inviting us to embrace the kingdom of God, to join God in making all things new as God unites heaven with the earth. Um, Jesus invites us to see ourselves and to see other people and to see creation, nature, the natural world, uh, to see all of reality, in, including God, in a new way. Because many of us um, ha haven't been looking at God properly. We've imagined that God is uh, judgmental, that God is harsh, that God is... Um, or we perhaps we've imagined that God is disconnected or far away or doesn't care or... Some people even imagine God doesn't exist. So he invites us to see ourselves in a new light, to see others in a new light, to see creation, reality, God in a new light. Uh, he invites us to go back. Um, the, the Sermon on the Mount keep, it keeps folding back on itself. It's like it won't let, it, it won't let you get out of it, <laughs> which is good. Uh, we get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and it basically tells us, now go back and read this again. Um, go back and meditate on this. Go back and make sure that you're applying this in your life. And so we work our way through it again. We get to the end, and it sends us back to the beginning. And, and this, this goes over and over again. And I think that's purposeful, um, because that's what discipleship is all about. Um, Jesus' younger brother, James, years after the Sermon on the Mount, 
<clears throat> years after the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Christ, uh, says essentially the same thing uh, in chapter one, where he says, but be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. Uh, the word that's translated uh, look into means to look carefully into. Um, and that's why I put the word study in parentheses. Um, we, we are called to find the deep wisdom that is under the perfect law of liberty. Um, all, all of Scripture is inspired by God, and all of Scripture has a depth to it, which we don't plumb just simply by reading it on the surface. Um, the whole of the Bible is meditation literature. It's meant to be studied. It's meant to be... Um, uh, gone over again and again to be looked at carefully. And, you know, we saw this um, previously in our study on the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus was uh, in that section, you know, where Jesus was saying, um, well, you, you're, I, he, well, he starts out by saying, I didn't come to get rid of the law of Moses. I came to fill it full. And then he explains how, how, how to fill it full, how to fulfill the law. And it's by looking under it. It's not just on the surface. Okay, I'm not supposed to kill anybody. Check. But looking deeper than that, I'm not supposed to carry animosity, hatred, uh, unforgiveness in my heart. You know, um, and you, could, you that that applies to the whole Bible, uh, every passage. Um, that's why it's it's good to have that broad overview to know the general narrative arc that the whole scripture is headed towards. That's important always to keep in mind. Uh, but it's also important to take the time to really um, bore down on the the deep wisdom that's in each verse. And and that I don't think ever ends. I know it doesn't in this life. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to be digging into it. Um, for many a millennia to come. So Jesus gives us a simile here. He says that the person who um, hears his word and does it is like a man who builds a house on rock. And the person who hears it but does not do it is like a man who builds on sand. Um, the simile really has two levels of meaning. The The one that we always focus on and Probably we focus on it um, because we're Americans, and uh, Americans are all about individuality. We think it's all about us as individuals, um, and and that's a very legitimate meaning. It, it it does have that individual meaning. We'll talk about that in just a second, but it also has another meaning, and and that is or another level of meaning, and that is what I would call a corporate level. What I mean by that is that Jesus saying here these similes about uh, building your house on rock or on sand, um, these not only apply to us as individuals, but they apply to countries, they apply to societies, they apply to empires. Um, in context, Jesus, I think, is, is applying it to the state of Israel at the time that he was speaking. Um, but it also even applies to, you know, it can apply to denominations and communities and that sort of thing. But let's look at the uh, the obvious meaning, the one that we see all the time, and that's the individual meaning first, and then we'll come back to the corporate one. So uh, he's told us that hearing his word but not acting on it leads to a gigantic fall. And uh, there's always the danger of hearing God's word, whether it's in a Bible study or whether it's in our own personal reading uh, or in a sermon, and walking away and forgetting the message. Um, it, it's, it's something that, that I struggle with with my own teaching. 
You know, there are many times when um, I'll, I'll prepare a, when I have prepared a, a, a sermon or a Bible study, um, and and I present it, and I, I don't mean to be a hypocrite. I present it um, truthfully and honestly. I really mean it. But then um, it, it dawns on me, uh, I think because the Holy Spirit's tapping me on the shoulder, uh, sometimes months later, hey, now this is something, you know what this means, but you're not doing it. Um, it's easy, easy to do. Uh, it's easy to run on autopilot. It's easy uh, for us. In fact, in, in some branches of Protestantism, especially, I should say North American Protestantism, especially, um, we, we tend to separate faith and discipleship. It's like, um, it, and it's usually not put this bluntly, but it, it's like we are teaching people, well, have faith in Jesus. That's your ticket to heaven. And then if you want to, uh, really get serious about following him. Uh, that's not biblical. Um, the two go together. Faith and trust in Jesus means doing what Jesus said to do. Uh, they're inseparable. So, um, you know, Jesus warns us that hearing without acting is going to cause us to miss the mark. It's going to cause us to have some sort of a collapse in our lives. Um, if we're not de doing what Jesus said to do, then we're building on sand. It's not enough to have proper doctrine, to have our belief systems in order, um, you know, to be members in good standing of a faith community, to engage in sacraments or rituals, um, to be a good law-abiding person. All of that um, is not enough. Th those are all good things. It's good to know doctrine. It's good to have your belief system um, in in healthy shape. <laughs> it's it's good to belong to a group of people who are trying to follow Jesus and um, you know liturgies and and um, sacraments and rituals can be very very powerful. And of course, we're all supposed to be law-abiding people, unless the law is commanding us to do something contrary to God's will. Um, so that's all good, but we have to be doing what Jesus said in addition to those things, um, if we are going to build our lives on that rock foundation. And Jesus in this simile says, you know, the person who builds his or her life on uh, or solid rock foundation, the, the the rains fall and the flood tides rise and the wind blows, but the house, the life stands strong. Um, uh, we, all of us as individuals, we experience um, trials and tribulations, which are likened unto a flood here in Jesus' uh, illustration. Um, we all experience difficult times. Maybe it's bereavement, the loss of someone that we love. I know when, when our son Elliot died, I for many many months, I just uh, you know the flood analogy was really applicable because I I felt like I was drowning. Um, I felt like somebody drowning, you and you come up just to gasp for air, only to get pushed back down under the waves again. Some people go through terrible divorces. Uh, they deal with chronic illnesses, all kinds of trials and tribulations um, and difficulties. And, and then there's the final flood that all of us uh, are going to face in, unless Jesus comes first, and, and that's physical death. Um, the one, and you can think of physical death as being like a flood um, that sweeps us away from this life. Um, but if our lives are built on the rock foundation of not only hearing what Jesus said to do, but actually doing what Jesus said to do, then uh, that flood is not going to wash us away. None of them are. None of those floods are going to wash us away uh, if our lives are built on that rock foundation. Uh, you remember uh, 
Lady Wisdom from the book of uh, of uh, Proverbs. Uh, her name is Hokmah. Uh, we talked about her when we were studying the book of Proverbs. Um, well, that's that's a personification of God's wisdom, and of course, Jesus is God incarnate. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, close similarities there, and we're we're encouraged in the book of Proverbs to, as it were, figuratively speaking, to take Lady Wisdom's hand um, if we are trying to discern uh, good from bad based on our own desires or based on our own intuition, that's, that's sand, um, that's foolish. But if we trust in God's wisdom, um, then we're going to be in good shape. Um, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24 and following, because I, this is Lady Wisdom, this is Chokmah speaking, because I have called you and you refused, have stretched out my hand and no one heeded, and because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when panic strikes you. Now notice the figures of speech here. When panic strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind. Uh, panic, calamity, coming like a storm. Rains falling, flood tides rising, um, winds blowing. Whirlwind is another name for a tornado. Uh, when distress and anguish come upon you. So uh, there you can see in Proverbs that uh, the trials and tribulations of life are likened unto storms. And the collapse is likened unto a structure which can't endure those storms. So Jesus is calling us to go back, back over the Sermon on the Mount, back over uh, what he has said, and we could expand that. I mean, I think the basis of everything Jesus teaches is the Sermon on the Mount, uh, but he said a lot more than that. So, you know, if you have one of those Bibles where the words of Jesus are in red, what he's saying is to go back and uh, let each of those, uh, all, all that stuff that's in red letters, let it sink in meditate on it, pray it into your heart, pray that it becomes part of our character so that we're doing what Jesus said. Um, you know, because we're building lives, we're building character. Even if we are elderly people, we're still building character. And we should be building in anticipation of storms because storms always come. So Jesus said, and this takes us back to Matthew 4, 17, just before the Sermon on the Mount. Rethink your life in light of the fact that the kingdom of the heavens is now open to all. Rethink your life. Am I, am I building on the solid rock foundation of hearing and doing what Jesus said? Am I actually putting these things into practice? Am I participating in the kingdom in that very real, concrete way. The second level of meaning, um, and I'm certain that Jesus also had this in mind when he was speaking, is, is that corporate level of meaning. Um, and the reason I think Jesus, uh, the reason I say that I'm sure that Jesus had this in mind is because Jesus was Jewish. He was a Jewish rabbi. And everybody that he's talking to in the Sermon on the Mount originally, uh, all of those people were Jewish. Uh, as a Jewish man, Jesus would have memorized the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the complete Torah. He would have had that totally memorized before he was 12 years old. So, um, uh, so he, he's familiar with what we call the Old Testament. His listeners are familiar with what we call the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is uh, full of references to enemy armies being like floods. For example, in Isaiah 8, uh, verse 6, um, the scripture says, because this people, that's the nation of Israel, he's talking about the northern kingdom of Israel. This is after... 
uh, the reign of Solomon after the kingdom split into the northern kingdom of Israel with its capital city of Samaria and the southern kingdom of Judah with its capital city of Jerusalem. Um, because this people, specifically the northern kingdom of Israel, has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently. Therefore, the Lord is bringing up against it the mighty flood waters of the river, the king of Assyria in all his glory. So you can see there that uh, the Lord, you know, through Isaiah, is equating the armies of Assyria with floodwaters. You, you've refused the, the gentle stream that, that brings life and health. Um, and because of that, this huge flood is going to come. These armies are going to sweep over the land, which of course happened in 722 BC. Um, so uh, you've rejected the waters of Shiloh. That, that's actually a picture of the waters of Shiloh today. Uh, in biblical times, this is where Jerusalem got its water. Um, this was, um, I mean, eventually, um, well, let me back up. The, this river, this stream, uh, flowed right next to the city of Jerusalem. So it, it was their source of fresh water. Um, it was a gently flowing uh, stream or small river of life-sustaining water. Um, when um, the city of Jerusalem was under siege later during the time of King Hezekiah, Hezekiah had a tunnel built which allowed the water from this stream to be brought inside the city walls. And it was a rather remarkable engineering feat. Um, and it's still there today. You can wade through the Hezekiah's tunnel. Always a fun thing to do on a trip to Israel. Um, but the the point was that this is, this is sustaining water. This is good water. This is water um, that's symbolic of God's gentle wisdom, his non-coercive guidance. But Isaiah says to the nation of Israel, you've rejected that, and the result is this flood. The Assyrian army is going to sweep in and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel, which it did, as I said, in 722 BC. Um, Jeremiah and Ezekiel both use the same simile, uh, referring to um, enemy armies as a flood. Um, Jeremiah, from his standpoint in the city of Jerusalem, Ezekiel was carried captive um, previously, and he's speaking from a refugee camp in Babylon. And both of them refer to uh, the Babylonian army as being a flood. After Babylon, um, the Jewish nation was controlled by Persia, by Greece, by Syria, and now in Jesus' time by Rome. So when Jesus talks about flood, he's talking about among other things, the Roman army. Um, he knew that Israel was on a collision course with Rome. And in what we call the Olivet Discourse, which is recorded in Matthew 24 and 25, Luke 13 and Luke 21, I mean Mark 13 and Luke 21, um, <clears throat> uh, th that Olivet Discourse, you know, it's when the disciples see the magnificent buildings of the temple compound and they say look at that look at this beautiful place and jesus says um yeah that's it it is beautiful and you know what not one stone's going to be left on top of another and he gives instructions to his disciples to his followers he says when you see jerusalem surrounded by armies then know that its desolation is near and if you're uh, in the city uh, get out um if you're outside the city, don't come back in. Head for the hills. Uh, because you guys, the followers of Jesus, are the remnant. You're the ones who are uh, not going to be completely swept away by Rome um, because you're living according to the principles of the kingdom of God. Jesus said to his disciples, to his followers, to his apprentices, 
put away the sword. Uh, resist injustice, but not by violence. Don't compromise with injustice, but at the same time, don't violently revolt against injustice. Um, and by and large, the population of Israel was not willing to do that. They were not willing to follow the ways of Christ. Um, so in that analogy, the house that Jesus is talking about that um, was built on sand and had a great collapse is a reference to the temple. Um, Jesus is the prophet like Moses. Um, and like Moses, he, he warned the nation of Israel. Um, remember, he turned over the tables. He drove the money changers out. He said, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. Um, this temple, this beautiful temple, which is supposed to be the center of Israeli worship, is built on sand. It, it's really worshiping. It's really not worshiping Yahweh. It's worshiping uh, mammon, money. And also, the nation is worshiping Mars. There was a a a, a, uh, a rise of the zealots. Uh, more and more people, more and more people were um, um, being recruited by the zealots, uh, who were developing this this underground uh, guerrilla warfare force to um, use essentially terroristic tactics to come against Rome. It's not the way of the kingdom. It's understandable from a, you know, from a secular point of view, but it's not the way of the kingdom. Um, and because they weren't willing to do things God's way, therefore uh, Rome completely crushed them. And in that sense, Jesus is the new Israel himself. He faced the wrath of Rome on a rock called Golgotha, Calvary, and he did what the nation didn't do. He stayed faithful to the covenant with Yahweh. So Jesus' point is that, uh, and again, it has the, the individual application. As an individual, I need to pay attention to what God is saying. I need to do what God is saying. I need to spend time uh, meditating, especially in the words of Jesus, and praying them into my heart. I, I want those words to be so ingrained in me that, I, um, that it changes my character so that, I, so that I naturally do the things that Jesus wants us to do. But it also applies to empires. It applies to the nation of Israel. It applies to empires today. And when you look at history, all empires eventually implode. Um, some of them very spectacularly, so others just kind of fade away, but it's not uncommon for that to be a spectacular implosion. Well, why do they die? Well, because they're not built on the foundation of doing what Jesus said to do. Um, they have an unstable foundation. Like, for instance, in our case, in the United States, um, this unstable foundation is this Christianized nationalism. Empires, and I don't just mean the United States, any empire in history uh, exists based on consumerism, violence, coercion, and control. Every empire, as far as I know, without exception, maybe there are, but I, I don't know of any exceptions, every empire is built on violence. It starts out with, with war, with conquering, with overrunning, um, usually with enslaving people, um, grabbing, stealing their land. Um, and, of course, the American empire is no different in that respect. Jesus said, if you choose to live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Now, that applies to individuals, but it also applies to nations. Um and it also applies to other sorts of um, institutions. Uh, it can apply to denominations, to faith communities, to global businesses. Um, 
most global businesses are are built on mammon. Um, the, the, it's all about making money. Um, who cares if it's if it's um, ethical, if it's just, if it uh, destroys the environment? None of that makes really any difference. Now, unless those things affect the bottom line, um, then you know when business discovers well, being nice to people actually is good business. Well, then we'll be nice to people. But what's the motive? The motive is still mammon. Um, so. you know, that that can happen also. And that's what I mean by a, a corporate uh, interpretation of th these similes. Um, they also, these other institutions crumble because they're not built on the words of Jesus. Um, they're not doing things the kingdom way. Now, we're not, we don't have control over, you know, multinational corporations. Um, as far as I know, maybe you do, <laughs> um, but, uh, what, what we, it, it's important for us and for, um, the, the communities that we are a part of, that we seek to do things the way God does things. Everyone then, Jesus said, who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. The first application of that is for us individually, personally. Am I, as an individual, am I hearing the words of Jesus? Well, good, that's a start. Okay, now am I acting on those words? Am I doing what Jesus said to do? If so, when the trials and tribulations of life come against me, uh, my life is not going to collapse. When, when the final flood comes, physical death, uh, it's not going to sweep me away to oblivion. My life is going to stand strong because it's built on hearing and doing the words of God. You can take that same principle and apply it to a faith community or to a nation or to a, uh, an empire. Um, I don't know that there's ever been an empire which has heard the words of Jesus and done them. Um, you know, they were talked about the Holy Roman Empire. Um, we talk about the United States being a Christian nation, being a city set on a hill, all that stuff. Uh, it hasn't happened. Uh, Israel, the chosen nation of God, uh, heard the words but didn't do them. Uh, Judah, the remnant, heard the words but didn't do them. Who did hear the words and do them? <laughs> it was the followers of Jesus. It was those believers in the first century who loved not their lives to death, who uh, were determined to follow Christ no matter what the cost. And the cost was often quite high. And when trials and tribulations came against them, when they were persecuted by their fellow Jews, when they were persecuted by Rome, when they were rounded up in the Colosseums and the lions and all that stuff, um, they, they, their, their lives didn't collapse. The church didn't implode. Um, in fact, the church just got stronger. Um, so you can see that there's an, uh, an individual application, and there's also a corporate application of these words. So I wanted to invite you to do a thought experiment, and I hope this doesn't freak anybody out, or it's, it's not certainly not meant to uh, uh, scare anyone. But... God gave us an imagination, and uh, uh, early Christians uh, used to call um, the human imagination uh, the uh, inner sanctum. Um, they felt like in your imagination is where you can really connect with God, and there's so much truth in that, you know. Um, it, uh, for instance, uh, just to give you an example, maybe you went through 
something difficult as a child. Uh, if you can go back and relive that experience in your mind, but bring Jesus into it, use your imagination to bring Jesus into it, or uh, to bring your adult self into it, to soothe that little girl, that little boy who went through a difficult time, that has tremendous power to change the way uh, things in the past affect us. It doesn't change what happened to us, obviously, but it changes the, the way it continues to affect us. Um, so the, the imagination is a gift from God. Um, and in fact, we're, we're invited all through Scripture to imagine a better world, to imagine a world um, that is, um, to imagine the kingdom of God, you know, where everyone is treated with fairness and with justice and where love prevails. Um, so I want to invite you to use your imagination and imagine this American empire that we live in completely imploding. I'm not a prophet. I'm not saying it is, it's going to happen. I'm just saying just, you know, for the, for the time being, imagine that. And then describe what it is that you imagine. What does that look like? And then talk about what you would do if what you imagined really happened. Just a little thought experiment to think about how the application of Jesus' words apply to a nation as well as applying to us as individuals. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, I thank you for your loving kindness and mercy. And we are in such desperate need of the power of your Holy Spirit in our individual lives and in our collective lives. We need you, Lord, to show us not only what Jesus said, not only what the Word says, but how to apply it in our lives. We need courage to apply it in our lives. We need strength to apply it in our lives. We need um, to have you so saturate us with your grace and love and mercy that it transforms and changes our very nature, our character, so that what we're praying is that you would mold us and shape us into individuals and collectively as a group of individuals, that you would mold and shape us into a people who spontaneously do what Jesus said, so that we would come to the place where we wouldn't even really have to think about it, that our natural reaction to a situation um, would be to respond as Jesus would respond. So if we're struck on one cheek, that we would naturally turn the other cheek, and so forth. Father, we ask that you would make these things to be real in our hearts and in our lives, because we want to be and we want to be with people who are hearing your word and doing it. We want our lives individually and collectively to be built on the solid rock foundation of hearing your word and putting it into practice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.